Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Executive Vice President and Chief Innovation Officer, Avis Budget Group, Arthur Ordunia. Hi. Different bow tie than, uh, than that one. You guys have incredible patience and huge bladders, <clears throat> from what I can see. So, so um, first a shout out. We've got a lot to go through the next, what, 35 minutes or so? Just kidding. Um, but first a shout out to Skift. Thank you very much for putting on this forum. Right? And uh, a really amazing venue. I mean, this is like where Wynton Marsalis plays. Uh, and they put makeup on me. I mean, that's, that's, that's kind of neat. All right, so um, I'm really excited to be here, in all seriousness, because I'm going to share something new with everyone, and that's always cool. Um, and I think it's something that's actually critical to everyone's business in the travel industry, and that is a serious note. But before we dive into that, I have a couple of quick questions. First, could everyone raise their hand who in the last two weeks found themselves um, in gridlock or bumper to bumper traffic wherever they happen to be in the last two weeks. I'm trying to see this. It's just about everybody. Okay, second question. When you were stuck there, when you were in traffic, I want the people to raise their hands whose first thought was, oh my God, my, I wonder if my, my travel customers are also stuck in traffic wherever they happen to be on their trip and how it's impacting them. How many people? Anyone? So it's just me? Well, look, it's not unusual, right? Because uh, in essence, when we think about things like traffic and urban congestion, we look at it from the perspective of individuals, right? We don't, because at Avis Budget Group, we're not just a car rental company, and a pretty good one, I think. We also happen to own what I believe is the world's best car sharing brand in Zipcar. So that puts us at this really unique intersection, right? On one hand, we're in urban mobility, and therefore we're really focused on congestion, as well as being a player, as are all of you, in global tourism and travel. So sitting in that intersection, guess what? We see something that is really, really frightening. We think that urban congestion is going to be potentially one of the biggest threats to all of us in this industry. We were so concerned about it that we commissioned a study with Texas A&M's Transportation Institute. And that study is what I'm going to be sharing with you, or at least I highlights of it, early, early highlights, um, with, with all of you. And there's two unique aspects. Well, I think there are multiple unique aspects, but two of the unique aspects and some of those things that we'll share. One is I believe this is the first time that someone has actually taken a look at the impact of global travel on urban mobility and urban congestion. And the second, is that we, I, I believe this is also the first time that we've actually looked at the attributes and behaviors of business and leisure travelers with regards to new modes, technologies, and services of next generation mobility. That's a phrase. Um, but I wanna, so I, what I wanna do is I wanna set up what we did in the study, right? What we were studying. And then I wanna give you some of this brand new, um, some of the brand new highlights with regards to that. And then I have a request. So let's start though. So in terms of the actual study, um, we looked at the domestic travel market, the United States travel market. And I think a lot of you are familiar with these kinds of statistics, right, already. Headline, it's really large, right? Almost two billion leisure trips, almost 500 million business trips, year over year growth, and looking out, things look pretty good. Who did we actually look at? Who did we talk to in terms of our customers? Well, while we looked at as many segments as possible, we actually focused heavily on boomers, that's me, and millennials, like my kids. Why? Well, the share of travel of millennials specifically has increased almost 20 percentage points over the last seven years, for example. 
And I found this a bit surprising, especially knowing how much money my kids make, that they actually average a fair amount of trips on an annual basis, right? I mean, two, according to this, two and a half business trips, more than three leisure trips. Um, they're also doing this thing, which I think a lot of us do, called bleasuring, which is a really awkward word, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, I hope we find something different. Um, and, uh, and, and in all seriousness, again, what's important about looking at millennials is they're digital first. There's actually an element of frugality in what they do. They're part of an on-demand environment. They grew up in an on-demand environment. And what they do is going to shape what we do in terms of transportation and travel, period, moving forward. So um, kind of the setup, and to continue with the setup, I think we all know, obviously, that there's a lot at stake. Travel is a big business here in the United States. There was $1.1 trillion spent, and of that, that actually generated about $170 billion plus in tax revenue. Why am I focusing on tax revenue? Because that's positive impact to the cities, right? How about here, where we are today? How many people here are native to New York City or the environs? Do you realize that <clears throat> last year, seven New York cities visited New York City? <laughs> Think about that. I mean, that's what 65 million visitors really translates into, right? And a heartening statistic to me, there are actually more people employed in tourism in, across the five boroughs than there are in finance. I don't know. I think I, I find that really positive. Yes, let's, let's, let's applaud us. And then in terms of numbers, obviously, I know you can read, but $44.2 billion, which is not just that spend, it, that actually led to more than $70 billion in terms of economic impact. This is great. This is fantastic. These numbers are good. What's happening in parallel to this? This. In the United States, the headline here is every year, the issue of congestion and the numbers have just gone up. Period. On average, 54 hours. That's what the average US con consumer spends commuting, all right? And because of that, what we found in the study is that people have avoided more than close to 50 million road trips that they originally, originally were planning to do because of this. Here in New York City, headline, it sucks even more, <laughs> all right? We know that I had to commute in from Jersey. Give me a break. So, you know, more than double, 92 hours. That's more than two weeks if you work an eight-hour day, and most of us don't, right? And economic impact on an individual basis. So wait, Arthur, this is still about commuters. This is the travel industry. We're talking about travel. It's not just commuters who drive, right? 2017, in the United States, the majority of business and leisure travelers used a vehicle, used a car. Almost 80% of them, cars that they own. 11% of them, cars that I own. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, and 16% on airplanes, which I found counterintuitive, actually, as a consumer. I was like, wow, it's airplanes and trains and then automobiles. <clears throat> this is great from one perspective. From another perspective, we're contributing to the problem, right, in terms of congestion. What does that mean? It means that travelers are cutting back. So let's get to some of our findings, right, from this study. First, in the survey, we found that business and leisure travelers whom we talked to, more than 80% of them significantly noticed increased road congestion in the past 12 months. And guess what? Almost 50% of them therefore avoided trips by cars because of it. Now when we dug into the reasons why, two things kind of stood out. There were, there were multiple reasons, but for example, two thirds of those customers found that it was really hard to find a parking spot. I don't know what they're talking about in New York, right? I mean, come on, it's really easy. And it's expensive. It's expensive, I mean, my God. Um, so, so uh, and again, all right, rental cars, fine. 
impactful to us, but not to the rest of the industry. Well, hell it is, right? Six of 10 leisure travelers expect to visit a city as part of a business or a, a leisure trip, or part of a leisure trip in 2019, which sounds like a good statistic until you take into account the fact that that's actually 10 percentage points down, right, from three years. So this is not good, is the key headline. We've been seeing this, obviously, first because of that unique combination of having Zipcar. How many people here are Zipcar members, by the way? Thank you. Keep using them um, for a lot of these reasons, as well as, as well as Avis. So we've been doing something about it, bluntly, not because we were incredibly you know, um, charitable from the beginning. It's because this was our business, right, in terms of mobility. So, We've been looking heavily at new forms of mobility. And what I want to quickly go through with you are three areas that we've been focused on, our partners have been focused on, and I'm bringing them up because I think you can contribute in there too, right? So three areas. First, on-demand vehicles, micro-mobility. I always think of like tiny little cars, but it's not. Multimodal applications and smart city platforms. These are related. Let me explain how. When we talk about on-demand vehicles and micromobility, this is actually looking at alternate forms of transport, such as e-scooters, such as city bikes, also new forms of shared transport, such as ride hail, Lyft and Uber, and also some really cool things in microtransit, a company called Via, who we're partnering with, and we're working with all of those companies too, which is actually partnering directly with cities to attack things like congestion as well as mobility deserts. Right. How many people here have taken a VIA? Excellent. Right. So here are all these things. One of the things that we found in our study, two things actually, which should be important to all of you therefore. 40% of business and leisure travelers when asked said that they would use an alternate form of on-demand vehicle or micromobility on a trip if it was available to them. Even more importantly, almost every single one of them said they expected to use in the, coming, in the coming years new and alternate forms of transport, they expect it, right? How are you integrating that into your thinking? So here's the thing. Cool, micromobility. How the hell do I find it? So multimodal apps. How many here use Google Maps? Cool, Google should be happy. So um, how many of you have noticed in the last month a new feature that they've included on multimodal? and have used it. Dudes, come on. Check this out, because what it does is it allows you to actually stitch together different forms of transport to better get around wherever you are. So not just cars, but also things like public transit and this amazing thing called walking, right? It's really good. The walking thing is good. Um, and so what we're doing here is we're sharing our data. So for example, City Mapper which is a multimodal uh, opportun uh, uh, platform in, in, uh, in the UK. We're sharing where our Zipcar London locations happen to be, which happen to be heavily EV, and they float, right? So that, so that people who are visiting London or people who live in London can utilize that information to stitch together an optimized kind of trip, right? It's sharing data. And sharing data leads to the third category, which is about smart city platforms. There we're working with cities like Kansas City, Los Angeles, and London to share information so that they, we share information about our, about our fleet, fleet activities because we have connected cars, and they're able to do not only better urban planning, but reduce congestion. So partnering with cities, I think that's something that we can all do here, right? And in doing so, we actually can start taking bites out of congestion. So these are things we can do today. Quickly, what are some things that are coming down the pipeline that we're interested in and should impact you? So the first is looking at virtual reality or VR or augmented reality or, or, or AR or whatever makes you look that silly as like this guy, right? So we already are dealing with an early form of that, all of us. In looking at some previous surveys, 47% of business travelers are reducing travel because they're using video conferencing, right? 
evolve that into, into um, where VR is going to be. We see it as double-edged is the headline. It could be good, it could be bad. One potentially negative impact, in our study we found that 42% of business travelers would actually put that thing on and use VR instead of actually traveling. I will not be one of those, right? But on the positive side, I think a lot of you already know this. Leisure travelers are planning or would plan trips and take potentially more trips, according to our surveys, if they had VR capabilities to do that. So, so the takeaway here is it is a technology. It is going to get more prevalent. How do we make it more positive than negative? Final thing I want to touch on, I'm almost out of time, is to me the golden goose of next generation mobility. Do you notice a driver? Answer, no. Right, so this is an Optimus vehicle. They're starting to do pilots out in Brooklyn. Uh, really cool. And this year, AAA did a survey, and they found that three quarters of American drivers are scared of self-driving cars. How many people here have, last, no, second to last question, how many people here have been in a Waymo or a true, um, true uh, driverless vehicle? All right. Exactly, like three of us, right? So, because in my, in my mind, um, fear is rooted in ignorance and lack of knowledge. So what it really means is, People really haven't, looked, haven't been in a self-driving car. However, what's helpful for us is there are experiences right now that are setting the stage. People may recognize this. This is the interior of Cabin, which is an overnight medium haul service going between Northern and Southern California, right? Um, and uh, today there's a driver, but this is a natural for getting no driver behind that wheel. Maybe he's already asleep, who knows, at this point. <laughs> Who recognizes this or has taken a test loop? They've gone into a pivot. Yeah, it was great, right? So test loop, a fleet of Tesla 3s running between Southern California cities and Las Vegas. I wonder why. Um, and, uh, and again, they were using autopilot. All of these two examples are essentially taking a look and saying, look, the behavior is there, right? Now remember, AAA found hesitancy. Guess what we found? In our study, we found that 60% of leisure travelers, 70% of business travelers, 80% of millennials are willing to take self-driving elements and legs in their journeys. That's cool. It's cool especially for us because for the last three years we've been partnered with Waymo, who in my opinion is the leading AV provider. We've been managing their fleets in Phoenix and in California, and earlier this year we started offering Waymo AV rides to Avis preferred customers in Phoenix so that we could learn and also we're learning that they like it. It's kind of cool, right? So summing up, right now, there are things that we could do. There are things that are coming down the pipe. But to end where I began, in one sentence, urban congestion could seriously damage our industry if we don't do something about it. So here's my ask. Write this down, or you can go to this now, combatcongestion.com. Give us your contact information and we will send you either the report itself or the link to the study that should be completed in a couple of weeks. We want you to read it. We want you to challenge it, reach out with questions. But I, I predict something. I predict that once you read it and comprehend it, you will want to do something because you want a positive future for this industry as well as for this world because we can't even begin to contemplate what that other future looks like but I can tell you what that other future might look like if we don't do anything. In the words of that famous prognosticator, Yogi Berra, right? New York Yankee legend. No one goes there anymore. It's too crowded. Thanks for hearing me out.